Good morning. Go ahead and stand up. Let's worship the Lord. practice you know for the last hour before this and what a it, what a wonderful time of worship we've already had and we hope that you enjoy gathering with us and <laughs> and continuing our day of worshiping our lord and learning hopefully lots of new stuff all right let's continue to worship <laughs> welcome Serve, I'll serve in this life I lose. 
so good to see you this morning. I hope you enjoyed the rain that we had in this muggy weather. <laughs> I walked out the of my door the other day and went, oh, I'm in Florida. <laughs> no, no kidding. We're not used to this. Well, I just wanted to let you know, take a moment. Let's do our welcome and welcome one another. Right. I miss our disco music, but I like this. Thanks, Craig. I know, it's kind of airy. I feel like a fairy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's continue just to praise and worship him. Because when we raise our hallelujah, when we raise our praises to him with our whole hearts, we can see God's light drive out the darkness while experiencing the unfathomable, unfathomable mysteries of God. Even in the middle of our doubts and our fears, God is with us. Hebrews 4, 16 says that when we can boldly enter to his throne is, and is where we can find and receive his mercy and his grace when we need it the most. So let's continue to worship him and praise him through our doubts and our fears because he is with us.
with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. that we 
have the opportunity to come boldly before your throne. And when we do, you promised that we will receive mercy and find grace there. Father, your amazing grace is all we need. Amazing grace, how sweet
we sing this new song. It talks about God's salvation on that rugged cross. His love that he poured out over us to save us. And we sing hallelujah, Father. We praise you and give you all the honor. Behold the empty 
bowed, hallelujah. We love you. We worship you. We declare that you are good. You are redeemer, creator, provider, sustainer. You are our rock and our salvation. You are our all in all. We are dependent upon you. You gave us breath at that first moment that we were born. Yet before that, you knit us together in our mother's wombs. And even before that, before the creation of the world, you saw us and you knew us and you provided for us. And our soul cries out, our voices cry out, our hearts cry out, our minds burst with how awesome and how beautiful and how good and how lovely you are. Lord, we worship you and you alone. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your mercy. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, today is 9-11. And as we mark this anniversary, I just wanted to stop and ask you to think for a moment, where were you on 9-11-01? And uh, what were you doing when you found out about the tragedy? So let's just take a moment of silence and honor those who lost. Thank you. So we will continue today um, our Colossal Challenge. <laughs> um, so this is the Colossal Challenge Part 2. And remember that that's, that is a little bit of a play on words um, because it's not really a colossal challenge. Um, like I said last week, all of the heavy lifting was done by God on the cross when Jesus laid down his life. He became the perfect sacrificial lamb for every sin, every debt, everything is paid. Um, it is paid in full, you know, piff, you got that stamped on your life. Um, and so it's not a colossal challenge. Now, it's not super easy, right? Um, we are not there yet. Um, I learned a phrase a long time ago. Um, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm better than I was. And uh, that was a, that's a good thing. Um, I don't remember where I heard that or who said it first, but um, I kind of live by that. I'm not where I want to be. Um, God's still at work, and he's got a lot of work to do. Um, so uh, we're continuing in Colossians chapter 3, and part of the colossal challenge to you is uh, I'm asking you to memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17 in your version um, any way you want. Um, I would think memorizing it in the message would be quite a fun challenge. You can memorize it in the King James if that's um, something that you're comfortable with. Um, I've memorized it in the New Living Translation. It is actually different uh, from the years that I, I have a little brown leather Bible. Um, it's in the baggage in Japan. Um, and so this is a slightly different version. So the first section, the first thought, the first movement in Paul's letter to the Colossians is, since you have been raised to do life in Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Okay? And then later, a moment later, he says, let heaven fill your thoughts. And so resetting our mind on Christ, resetting our um, focus, our attention. Um, we're practicing the pause. If you've downloaded the pause app and you're, you're using that, I, I commend you. If you haven't yet, give it a try. Um, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I love it. As a matter of fact, um, I miss it if I, if I make a mistake and forget. So I'll go back and make sure to do it because it does keep track and it can tell you. Um, how many times you have done it. Um, but the whole point of last week, the whole point of this first section, uh, verses 1 through 4, 
is refocusing our attention on Christ no matter what is happening. Okay, we just sang about the storms of life. And I am safe in the middle of his hand. Jesus said, God places you in the middle of his hand and nothing can remove you from his hand because he's the almighty creator of the universe. So nothing can move God. So um, let me give you this next picture. Um, I just wanted to put that up because the second movement this week is um, stripping off our old sinful nature. So the subtitle, um, we're working on recreated in, in, in the image of Christ, but I titled it, subtitled it with Dying with Christ because it's stripping off, off our old nature, and that's the, the picture there um, of the, the dark. And as a matter of fact, I guess I could go ahead and do this. Um, I have worn black clothing for the last seven or eight years, and I've done that because, in part, I've been mourning that most of my life I felt like a child of the Israel wandering in the wilderness. You know, I was, in, I was under God's care. I was under his protection. He had provision, but I still didn't quite get it. You know, he gave me man, and I'm like, man, I want meat. You know, and he gave me quail, and it's like, chicken again? <laughs> I mean, come on, God. Can you give me a little bacon? <laughs> so anyway, um, I have learned to come out of mourning and to strip off my old um, black clothing and wear some colorful, creative things because that's part of this putting on a new nature, putting on Christ. And the theme this morning was red, orange, and uh, yellow, and so I kind of fit in. Um, it's like fire, that holy fire that, that drops down and, and transforms us. But in the, in the picture, it's beautiful because Christ is giving us a new mantle, uh, a new nature, a new outlook. And so that's the whole point of refocusing on Christ because we live in a broken world and we're broken people, but we don't have to stay there. Um, we can continually reset our focus on Christ. Okay, so let's jump into Colossians 3. Today we're going to look at verses 5 through 10. And remember the challenge is for verses 1 through 17. So if you have your Bibles um, and you want to follow along, I'll be reading verses 5 through 10. Again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And so Paul tells the Colossians, those in the church in Colossae, verse 5, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater. Uh-oh. Remember, we talked about that. Um, we had a whole middle message uh, sermon talking about anything that we put before or between us and God is idolatry. And so Paul warns um, that a greedy person is on the same footing as an idolater. And uh, in that context, those people truly understood because in the, in the Greek world, um, idolatry was a big thing you know the um, all of the cities Ephesus had um, their idols and Corinthians um, they had the problem with the idols the silver makers right um, continuing on half of uh, verse 5 worshiping the things of this world okay I'll, I'll go back don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world not what we should be verse 6 because of these sins, God ang God's anger is coming. You used to do them, are these things, when your life was still a part of this world. He's talking to the Colossians. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. And we stop there because... Next week's going to be the fun part where we get to put on the, the, the um, new nature. So the summary of where we're at, since we've been raised to new life in Christ, let us focus on the kingdom reality. Okay, I like to refer to the kingdom as a reality because it's, a, it's actually a reality that, that exists. 
and we can choose to be a part of it or not. We practice, rehearse, and proclaim who we are in Christ daily, moment by moment. Pause and reset our focus on Christ. We, we resist the urge to see only the physical reality, what we're surrounded by. Let us take up our cross and die to self. Let us live moment by moment each day as resurrected people. Let us think, speak, and act as one who is seated at the right hand of God. So we wait in expectation. We wait for him. And by the way, that was just in paragraph form all of the um, action points from last week. Um, our task is to continuously put to death our old sinful nature and put on Christ. We do this in cooperation and consenting to what God has planned for our life, to recreate us in the image of Jesus. And so this is, this is a heavy topic. And we're going to talk about the things that, that Paul listed here. Um, and he also there's also a list in Ephesians. And I do want to say this is not a complete list. Okay? Um, so just like the good things are not a complete list, the, the spiritual disciplines are not a complete list, this is not a complete list of all the vices. Um, I think the historically, you know, the seven deadly sins were an, an effort to kind of categorize all that. But I want... I wanted to put this symbol up again because it just speaks so beautifully to me. And I ask the question, where are you in Christ? And in a moment, I'm going to read Psalm 91. But if the pointer is working, okay, you, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that leads to God the Father God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the whole point of the, the tri is what this is called. It's a Celtic symbol. Um, I would like to think that the, the circle is love. You know, love binds, and, uh, and we'll get to that next week. Love binds us all together in perfect harmony, right? Um, but where are you in Christ? You're right there, okay? Y you and I exist in a reality where we are in the middle of the Trinity, okay? The almighty creator of the universe is responsible for everything. He knows, I mean, he's sovereign. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful, right? Um, and we have the Holy Spirit as the gift, the, the um, promised one, the comforter, the the challenger, the one who convicts and, and causes, says, hey, you know, you need to turn around, right? And Jesus is with us. Do not be afraid, right? So you and I are centered in this Trinity union with God. And that is the most perfect and wonderful place to be. Because as we were singing, no, no matter what's happening around us, all the, the turmoil and the conflict, um, war and strife and hate and envy and jealousy, all these things um, that Paul listed, which are natural. These are normal behaviors in, in the world. We, we don't have to be a part of that because when we reset our focus, when we reset our heart and our attention, we are in the hand of God. So that's where we are. We, when we are in Christ, we are with God. Oh, I, I, before I go on, I wanted to read Psalm 91. So just listen to Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of night, nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, those evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, 
no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hand so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who, I, who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Right? We are learning to be people planted by the river of living water whose roots grow down deep into Jesus and drink and we receive abundant life and health and wholeness and completeness. We're, we're healthy people who can have healthy relationships because of what he's doing in us. Okay? So let's move forward. Um, today, we're, we may... Oops, did I go backwards? What did I do? Oh, I am right. Okay, I've got the... Oh, there it is. I have two screens up here. Okay, I wanted to do a Dallas Willard quote. Guy's amazing. Um, he died in 2013, so he's no longer with us. He's, he's celebrating in the kingdom um, with the Father and with the Queen. Um, but he said, Dallas said, Vision of God secures humility. Seeing God for who he is enables us to see ourselves for who we are. This makes us bold. For we see clearly what great good and evil are at issue. And we see that it is not up to us to accomplish it, but up to God, who is more than able. We are delivered from pretending, from being presumptuous about ourselves, and from pushing as if the outcome depended on us. We persist without frustration, and we practice calm and joyful non-compliance with evil of any kind. Wow, can say it so well. And the reason I wanted to, to ask the question of where are you in Christ, put the triquatra, the fact that, that you and I are in Christ, we're saved. You know, the work is done. Um, it's up to him. We participate, and yes, there's work to do. We're not, we're not, um, we're not completely passive. Yes, salvation, the work on the cross was done by God and God alone, by Jesus Christ. We accept his salvation, and when we come into him, he works with us to transform us into the people who he wants to be. So it's not total passivity. The, the major work is, is done by God, uh, but we participate. Um, we're co, I don't want to use the word conspirators, because that puts a negative. Um, we're co-creators with Christ as he's recreating us in the image of his son. So today we have basically two points, and I'm not sure how long it'll take to get the, through the first point, so we'll see how time goes. If uh, we run out of time, we'll do the next point later. Um, so as I was thinking about what Paul wrote to the Colossians, and I left my, I did my bookmark, so I have to find it again. So Colossians 3. Um, what Paul was, was writing to, the, as I was thinking about the, the list of things um, that Paul wrote to them, and I was thinking about this, this um, colossal challenge, um, RAC, repent, admit, and confess, came to mind. And so, you know, ministers kind of like to do, to do acronyms and stuff. And I thought it, it was appropriate because, you know, we have the term, you know, you rack your brain. And I just wreck my brain trying to remember, trying to, to make something happen, and I, it just can't happen. That's how we often feel when it comes to sin in our life. You know, we just try harder. And though we are participants and we have to work with God, we don't have to try harder. That's, that's the whole point about depending upon the work that God has done in our lives. Our role is basically this, repent, admit, and confess. And so today I, I did add a couple of prayers um, from the daily prayer, but I also, later in the message, uh, one that you haven't seen before, it's called um, 
I just went blank on it, but I'll tell you what it is when we get there. So let's start with this. Dearest God, holy and victorious Trinity, you alone are worthy of all my worship, my heart's devotion, and all my praise, and all my trust, and all the glory in my life. I love you. I worship you. I give myself over to you in my heart's search for life. You alone are life, and you have become my life. I renounce all other gods, all idols, and I give you the place, God, in my heart and in my life that you truly deserve. This is all about you, God, and not about me. You are the hero of this story, and I belong to you. I ask your forgiveness for my every sin. Search me and know me and reveal to me where you are working in my life and grant to me the grace of your healing and deliverance and a deep and true repentance. So that's simply a prayer of resetting your place in Christ, in the center of God, right? It's, it's calling upon the Lord and confessing and saying, I need your help. This is all about you, God. It's not about me. Um, forgive me for my idols. Forgive me for my sin. And from Psalm, search me, O God, and know my heart. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's anything in me that I need to work on. Okay? So, repenting um, is from the Greek word metanao, metanao, uh, where it just simply means to turn around. Okay? You realize I'm doing something, I'm thinking something, I'm feeling something that that I'm uncomfortable with, that, that is not right. And I need to simply turn around or repent. I need to recognize that I'm on a path and I need to change that path. So remember that Jesus said from Matthew 4, 17, then on Jesus began to preach, repent for of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. So the very, one of the very first things that Jesus said to his people when he started his ministry was repent, turn around, look at the way you're going and, and, and change direction, rethink, refocus what you're, what, what you're uh, um, thinking about, what, what's happening in your life. So some thoughts. Um, when it comes to putting to death our old sinful nature, stripping off our sin. Um, it's, it's, yes, a part of a learning curve, but have you ever heard of the unlearning curve? Okay, because sometimes, well, phones are a good example. Okay, if you get a new phone or a new operating system, you have to kind of unlearn where all your buttons were in the first place, um, how to operate, how to turn it on, and, and when, with Amazon, I, I use a, an Android, and of course, I'm an iPhone user, and so they are night and day difference almost. Um, so it took me quite a bit of a, an unlearning curve to, to figure out where everything was. And so as we're learning to strip off our old sinful nature, part of the unlearning curve is unlearning the things that we think are normal. Okay? Remember that I, that I, I said these things um, that Paul listed, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires, greed, um, Anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language, lying to each other. These are just normal behaviors. Um, they are our natural way because we are a sinful people in a sinful world. And because of our sin nature, it's just natural to do this stuff. So we have to unlearn some of the things that our culture or our family or our friends taught us and, and really it's, we're at war. It's a battle to constantly rethink, is this normal? Okay? We tend, I mean, worldview, by definition, is the way you think things are. And all around the world, everybody has a worldview. And the way we think things are, are not always the way they're supposed to be. So that's why we have the, the lipness test, the standard, Right? We, we weigh everything according to the word of God. And if there is something in our spirit that says, you know, maybe that's not right. If we're not sure, that's when we go into prayer and we say, okay, Lord, you know, search me and know my heart, know my mind. It is what I'm thinking, is what I'm feeling, is what I'm 
doing in accordance with your word? Is, or is this something that I need to repent and turn around and, and change the way that I'm doing? And when we pray, when we seek God, he will be found. He will answer, right? Because God is always speaking. So a couple of other thoughts. Enemies without and enemies within. Now, I, for the most of my life, this is confessional, um, I, I kind of always had a problem with Paul. And uh, I, I, I think it was pride that was my false sense of pride that looked at Paul and thought, gosh, he's got to be the most proud person ever. And so I was judging him based on his writings. And, of course, I was misjudging him, and actually what I was doing was I was looking in a mirror and, and seeing myself. But in the same light, um, I kind of never got David. I liked David. I, I loved the Psalms growing up, but I, I didn't get David really until the last few years. And um, like I've told several of you, I have parts in my head, and, and uh, they're usually little boys, and they're dancing. Um, like David danced before the Lord. Um, and so I get that part, that just pure celebration. And an, a, another side note, one of the spiritual disciplines that we don't practice enough is celebration. You know, and so my soul cries out, hallelujah. Okay, that's why we sing, is because that, that celebration. And, and you and I need to learn to celebrate. Um, and, of course, it's, it's, it's celebrating who God is and what he's doing in our lives. A heart of gratitude leads to celebration. And when, when we see God for who he is, we celebrate. Okay, so I get, I get David with the celebration part. But what, where I wanted to go was the enemies. Okay, David, the Psalms, wrote a lot about his enemies. And I always took it as the guys who surrounded him you know, his advisors, or the Philistines. You know, they were the, duh, enemies out there. But I've come to realize that there are enemies without and enemies within. Um, and so as I've learned to reset my focus on Christ and put to death those sinful earthly things lurking within me. Okay, that's the key phrase. And in 2017... I think, 15, 16, 17, somewhere around there. I was sitting on my couch doing my, my morning prayer and reading through Colossians 3, and I read, I read the phrase, so I put to death sinful earthly things looking within me, and I stopped. And I said, okay, Lord, what are the sinful earthly things lurking within me? And so that began the journey of identifying the things that I needed to take care of. And it's, it's been an amazing journey painful, beautiful, terrible journey of allowing the Lord to work through his word, through his spirit, through people to, to name the things that I, I need to strip off. Um, those perpetual challenges to God, to his work in my life. And for my life, uh, many of them were uh, what I would call strongholds. When we consistently give ourselves over to a mental thought that off, um, almost always leads to action, okay, what we think comes out, then it becomes a stronghold in our life. It becomes something that is a colossal challenge. We, we just have a hard time overcoming it. So asking the Holy Spirit, you know, what are the things that I need to work on in my life? Please reveal to me. And guys, I can't tell you the importance of having an accountability group of people in your life. People who you can openly confess your sins one to another so that there may be healing. Um, that is so important. Someone that you can just be completely real and honest with. Because as I've, I've shared before, one of my... Um, Old sinful natures was the message that I can't be honest. I, ca I can't really show people who I am. I can't show you who I am because if I do, you won't like me. And you'll, you know, I'll, I'll face the scorn. And I've been putting that to practice. 
um, just being real and being open and sharing. And it's blowing me away against what my culture and my worldview thought when, I, when I'm totally honest with people and I say, yeah, I'm, I'm just broken, messed up. People respond, me too. And I get so much more grace than I ever thought I would. And, and that's the Holy Spirit working through you and me and others to make us more into the image of Christ. Okay? So that's the whole point of stripping off our old sinful nature. And next week we'll get into more of clothing ourselves with Christ. Um, but I did put up there, I'm not my worst enemy. Now, th- this is important. Um, and forgive me if I am not communicating this well. Um, for most of my life, I thought I had to kill parts of me. Okay? So th- the best way to explain it would be I, I, I have a wound from my childhood that tells me, you know, you're unloved. And so that wound would happen at about four or five years old. And so a part of me remained at that age believing that that was the truth. And so I spent many, many years thinking, no matter what the word teaches, no matter what my wife tells me or my kids or you guys tell me, it it can't really be true because you really can't love me because I'm not worthy of love. So do you see the, the, the messed up nature of that? that becomes an idol because I believe that message over the message of the Word of God, okay? And what I tried to do for many years was, in, in my mind, I tried to push that aside, and then I built these walls of prison, and I locked the door, and I ignored that part of me. And... The thing about it is, is, and we'll talk about this in a minute, it just always escapes, right? It gets out. I don't know how, but it gets out and shows up at the worst possible times. You know, you're going along, everything's good, and all of a sudden that little boy comes up and says something stupid or does something stupid, and, and it just messes everything up and go, oh, yeah. And so I became the hater of that part of me. And I tried to keep that broken, wounded part of me in prison. And for me, the healing was, first of all, recognizing it. I didn't know I had these parts, a bunch of them. And then inviting Jesus into the broken places in my life and in my heart and saying, I'm sorry that I've been so cruel to you, and I invite you out of that prison, and it took a while for me to coax these parts out, and I know this kind of sounds really crazy and strange, but it's what our our mind does to protect ourselves. We build these walls, and so there were times when I said, I know you can't trust me because I've been the enemy. I've been the bad guy. I've I've hated you, and I've, I've tried to kill you, and I'm sorry. For that, And so, can you trust Jesus? And the part will say, yeah, I can trust Jesus. And I say, well, I trust Jesus too. So maybe, and by the way, side note, that part didn't know that I'm 58 years old. It thought I was four years old too. And so I said, you know what, I'm not. I'm not a child anymore, and I don't need you to try to protect me. And so I invite you to reintegrate with me and If you can't trust me yet, trust Jesus, and we can trust Jesus together. And I have found healing from a lot of the wounds that happen in my life. And so that's, I want you to be careful because, yes, there are, you know, sexual sin, immorality, lust, shameful desires, greed, you know, things that we have to stand against and kill sin in our lives. But our wounded parts that were wounded by sin, we don't, we don't need to kill. Okay, so sometimes we say, I'm, I'm my worst enemy, and I want you to be careful of that because healing is the part of, of restoring and re- returning and renewing and making us whole, right? We're not broken up people anymore. 
we're restored as God works in our lives. So let's move to prayer. Jesus, thank you for coming to ransom me with your own life. I love you. I worship you. I trust you. Sorry, I didn't advance this one. I love you. I worship you. I trust you. I give myself over to you be, to be one with you in all things. I receive all the work and triumph of your cross, death, blood, and sacrifice for me through which my every sin is atoned for. I am ransomed and transferred, delivered from the kingdom of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of my, to your kingdom. My sin nature is removed. My heart is circumcised unto God and every claim being made against me is canceled and disarmed. I take my place now in your cross and death, dying with you to sin, to my flesh, to the world, to the evil one, and his kingdom. I take up the cross and crucify my flesh with all its pride, arrogance, unbelief, and idolatry, and anything else that I'm struggling with. I put off the old man. Apply to me all the work and triumph of your cross, death, blood, and sacrifice. I receive it with thanks and give it total claim to my spirit, soul, and body, my heart, mind, and will. So the second of the RAC, R-A-C, is admit. So admit and accountability. I could have done either one or both of them. I could have made it RAC, <laughs> R-A-A-C. But admit and being accountable. Admit, admit that I am helpless to control and manage my own sinful nature. So I wanted to put up here this list um, on the, your left we have, so put to death. These are the, the, the command form words that Paul says. So put to death, have nothing to do with, don't be. And in a couple of them, he gives results, right? He says, don't be because God's terrible anger will come, come upon those who do. Um, get rid of, don't lie, strip off. Okay, those are his commands. Those are the things he's telling us to do. And then I just put a list up there once again. Uh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is just idolatry, um, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language, and lying. Um, these are things that are common unto all humanity. Everyone deals with all of these. And understanding what they are, um, lust, for example, we, when we were talking about idolatry, you know, lust is usually seen in sexuality, but it, it's, there's a lot of things we lust for. You know, we can lust for a donut. Um, we can lust for money. Um, we can lust for what someone else has, right? Biblical terms for that. So um, I wanted to put this up. Um, this came from I'm, I'm, I'm discipling with um, a man. And we meet weekly, and uh, he's gone through uh, a real brokenness. And so I'm I'm coaching, uh, counseling, mentoring him. Um, and a few weeks ago, he was talking about um, I'm just trying to manage this circumstance, and he he kept saying I'm just trying to redeem it. You know, I'm just trying to make it right because obviously he had a crash, he had a failure, a moral, you know, uh, failure. And it's interesting because as I'm listening, as we're talking, I'm always praying, Lord, speak, you know, please, what, you know, how can I help? What, what can I say? And as he was speaking, we're sitting in a coffee shop and I just took and I kind of pulled my shirt apart and that got his attention. And he, and he said, what? And I said, well, you're, you're revealing that as you pull your shirt apart, you've got Redeemer on your chest there. And you're trying to play a role that was not made for you. Okay? And then so we started talking about the, um, um, the Incredibles. And, you know, honey, where's my super suit? Um, the idea is this. These are things that we think we can manage. These are things that we think we can control, and, and we can't. I mean, we cannot manage sexual immorality. We cannot manage lying. We cannot manage lust or greed 
or lying to each other, okay? And so I have to blend this in, uh, in this idea because I, if you on the lower right-hand side, I'm a movie kind of guy, and so I like to use illustrations from a lot of movies. This is from Doctor Strange, the lower right hand, and it's actually his cape. There's a name for his cape. I, I, I read it, but I forgot what it is. It's called the cape of something. Um, but if you've seen the movies, and these are outlandish, right? But in the movie, uh, the cape, and this is a cartoon character, right? But I want you to see that in every story, there's a part of the gospel. There's something about truth in every story. And so the thing about the cape is it has a mind of its own. I don't know if you've seen the movies, but there are times in the movie where he's maybe falling or somebody's falling and the cape will, you know, leave him and swoop down and catch the person just at the last moment, okay? And it's kind of a playful thing because he sometimes doesn't want the cape to do something and it does it on its own, okay? So when you merge the kind of the two things and the thing about... The thing about our supersuits is we think, you know, we think we have this redeemer supersuit or we think we have this savior supersuit that I can wear it and I'm going to manage and I'm going to take care of things. And so this process of removing our sinful nature, that's that supersuit, and and hanging it up. Sometimes we're just walking along in life and we look down and we go, "Whoops. I got my supersuit on again." You know, somehow it just came off of the hook, and I'm, I'm wearing it again because I think I can control, I think I can manage this. And confessionally speaking, I've got about 10 or 12 pegs of super suits hanging on the walls of things that I thought I could control, things that I thought I could manage. And for the most part, they're staying there. Um, I, I still have things that I'm going to work on, um, stripping off my old sinful nature. And again, next week when we really get into it, um, is clothing ourselves with Christ. That's the way. And praise. I mean, we sang about it again. Um, when, when we're praising God, when we're focusing on God, when we're thinking about God, when, when we're letting the scriptures filter our life and, and change the way we think, right, then we don't deal with these things. Okay, so confess, R-A-C, um, confess. Um, James 516, we've talked about it earlier, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And when I'm doing these PowerPoints, I get these suggested things. And I love that this did this. Um, I chose it this way because it put the so you may be healed separately, right? I think sometimes we quote the verse, confess your sins to one another. Maybe we leave off or add the and pray for one another, uh, pray for each other so that you may be healed, okay? It's, it's he, in healing as we are praying for one another, as we are confessing our sins to one another, as we're being real. That's, that's what God called us to be. That's what Christ wanted us to be, is just real with each other, okay? Um, so I don't have a whole lot to say about confession because we've talked about that more uh, in the past. So this, it's called good soil prayer. Um, this comes from John Eldridge's disciple, Morgan Snyder. And he's got a book and a whole long prayer. And so talking about confession, I wanted to put this up. So let's read through this together. Father, I confess that what I want is for my heart to be made whole and my life to be integrated. I confess that I want the freedom and restoration of my strength through the integration of the whole person. And I invite you to do it. I invite you to partner with me to become the man who accomplishes, astonishes you because we are united in love. And I've learned to do nothing apart from you. Father, I agree with your relentless love, your relentless pursuit that you will stop at nothing to continue to open the doorway to invite me home, for me to give access to you, to the whole man, and to be made whole and holy. Father, I confess the parts of me that have yet to yield to you, that are resistant, and I give you the shame and fear and disappointment and the hurt. 
I give you my belief that in life, I give you my belief in life being found in self-determination and self-reliance. I say your love is greater still. Your love is stronger than death. I ask that you would shine your light so that you would expose every part in me that has yet to come home to you as my good father. Amen. So, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cover uh, the next section, but I'm going to do it briefly. And really, warning, this is just an introduction. Um, the next is V-I-M. Um, V-I-M stands for Vision, Intention, and Means. And again, this is going to be a quick overview because we're going to come back to this and we're going to look at it more deeply. Um, the best illustration for vision, and, and this is the process of discipleship. The, I don't want to use the word steps, but the, the, the journey, the pilgrimage that, that we're on, by which we become the people whom God created us to be. Okay, we become uh, disciples of Jesus, students, apprentices to Jesus. So vision is that thing that we want to be. Okay, and the illustration is if and there's two there's two sides to it or two two aspects of it. Um, the first is learning a language. Okay, if you decide you're going to learn a foreign language, uh, an international language, um, so say Arabic. If you wanted to learn Arabic, what is it going to take for you to be an Arabic speaker? Okay, that's the vision. And so I'm gonna switch it because I'm a, I learn Japanese. And I'm going to give you the example of Japanese. Well, when we move to Japan, when, when a missionary moves to another country, they literally become a child, a, an infant, because they cannot understand what's being said to them, and they cannot communicate what they need. So you go grocery shopping, and like in a market, you don't uh, you know, <laughs> use any method you can to communicate that I want two of those. Um, you know, what are they? Well, I have no idea. And so um, the vision is the understanding of what I want in becoming a language learner, okay? Um, to be able to speak Japanese. And for me, the vision was that I would be able to teach people the word of God and, and share the good news of Jesus Christ with people. And that eventually happened. Now, it took years. People always ask me, how long did it take to learn Japanese? And my answer is, I'm still learning, right? Um, and so uh, the vision is seeing yourself and seeing the benefits of what it will take for me to get to that place, okay? Intention is, I plan to do it. Now, how many of you have studied a foreign language? Right? How many of you are fluent in it? Right? That's the thing is. And, and the intention, maybe there were good intentions there. You, you thought you might learn it. But um, really, taking a French course or taking a Spanish course in junior high or high school, I think most of us are just trying to do it to get the grade. And we're not really concerned about actually learning that language. Because we, you know, I took Spanish, I think, two years. Um, and I... I mean, I can understand Taco Bell stuff, right? But I do not speak Spanish. Um, and the means, um, the intention is, is that you are determined, you are going to do what it takes to see the vision completed, and the means are, is the path, the pilgrimage to get there. So um, the other one that is an illustration, it's, the, it's a negative aspect, is, is something like AA, or what we do here at, at, at C4 is CR. Um, it's... I am determined not to do the thing that is hurting me, like alcohol. And so I see my life, I see the benefits of not doing that. And the intention, which is very strong, and then the means are the path, the method coming week by week, confessing to one another, working through a 12-step program, and, and finding healing, happiness, and wholeness. That's the means, okay? So vision, intention, and means. Um, now, I'm, I put up another idea because um, 
I use brokenness a lot because I've I found like the song Casting Crows Crowns. Um, the freedom I found is just by con admitting that I'm a broken man. Um, but we we can't stay in brokenness, and we can't live in the try hard, because those are the two things that we typically do when it comes to our sin nature, when it comes to becoming uh, the disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. We, we, we tend to try harder. That's you and me, those in the Christian community. We, we put on our, gosh, I hadn't thought about this. Do we put on, wow, we put on a holy super suit, right? A righteousness, you know. I'm Mr. Righteous. <laughs> and uh, how it's almost like putting on a Halloween costume. I, uh, on that super suit page, I had a, a picture of a Halloween, a guy in a Halloween costume. It was uh, Mr. Incredible's costume, and it just looked so silly. And I, I took it off, but I should have left it up there because how foolish it is, is it for me to think that I can put on my righteous super suit and I can... I can go around and, you know, have my cape and cut my tights, right? And uh, my own righteousness, that's just pure foolishness. So it's not just the negative things that we can do. It's trying to put on positive things like our own righteousness, right? Um, so we don't just, whoop, I did it. We don't just try hard and we don't completely live in brokenness, we, we find a middle ground, and really it's training ourselves to be more like Christ. Or Dallas Word uses the, the word, Dallas Willard uses the word indirection. And he says, indirection says, don't just try hard. Train yourself, and training involves finding out why what happens in your life happens the way it does, and changing those conditions. So indirection and discipleship brings about spiritual formation and Christ-likeness, and that means that now the inner condition of behavior are transformed, the inner conditions. Okay? So it's not just trying harder, but it's and, and get that it's not total passivity. There, there has to be cooperation. So there's some trying... Um, and it's not just completely brokenness. Um, we do have to be broken. Um, that's the Holy Spirit working in our lives, convicting us of sin. Um, and it's actually a middle ground of training ourselves. So, vision. Um, from then on, Jesus began to preach. It was earlier, right? Repent and of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, vision is believing, seeing, knowing that you and I can be transformed. I, I think it's a part of our sinful nature that we don't believe we can be transformed. We, we don't believe we can be changed. Uh, a part of me saw Jesus, and, and yeah, he was perfect, but he was God's son, and there's no way I'll ever be able to be, be like Jesus. Okay, so shifting that mentality and understanding that Jesus said the kingdom is available. All you have to do is reach out and grasp it. Um, and then Matthew 5, 48, he says at the end of uh, this part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're on, um, but you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And um, he talks about the tree and its fruit and building on a solid foundation. And... I just want you to see that Jesus gives illustrations of, uh, of what it means to be transformed and changed. And I'm just going to skip over that, and I'm going to jump to intention, because this is just an overview, and we're going to come back to this, so I'll spend a lot more time on it. Um, Ephesians 4.13 teaches us that I can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Our intention is that we are going to become what Jesus called us to be effective healthy whole followers of jesus christ okay um so we're moving earlier we talked about 
the, the rightness of the Pharisees is what Jesus is talking about in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. We're moving from rightness of the scribes and Pharisees, their worldview, the way they thought to do it, to the righteousness of the kingdom of God. So we're shifting our focus to what we think, our old sinful nature, our, our worldview, to his worldview and what he wants us to be. And then the last one is means. And it's the journey by which we come to be Christ-like. And 1 Corinthians um, 11, 1, and you should imitate me just as I imitate, imitate Christ, Paul says. So he, being one of the best people who understood what it was like to be an effective follower of Jesus Christ, um, said, do what I do. You know, learn from me. And he's not saying he was perfect. He wasn't saying he's got it all together. But he was giving us a picture that we can be what God created us to be. Okay? Vision, intention, and means. So let's close this time in some prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll sing a couple of songs and have our service ending. So, Father, we come back to you um, confessing that we are a failed and a flawed and a broken people. And, Lord, we tend to try to manage our lives and take care of things, especially our old sinful nature, um, the wicked things lurking within us. And so, Lord, we invite the light of your holiness, the light of your glory um, to come into our lives. To, to we, we surrender and give freedom to the Holy Spirit to point out those areas that you're still working on in, in us. And Lord, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your freedom, for your patience, for your kindness as we work with you uh, to remove the things that we re need to remove in our lives, to confess the things we need to confess, to admit our failures and our faults and our hurts and our hang-ups. And, Lord, as we confess to one another, as we confess to you, you are bringing about healing in our lives. And, Lord, that's what we want. We want to be so transformed by the renewing of our mind that when we meet you face to face, there isn't much of a transition because you've already been at work in our lives all these years. And so thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace and your guidance and your love in our lives. Thank you for C4 Church. Lord, we're trusting in you every day, every moment for our future, for the past, and for the present. Lord, you are in control of everything. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we close out this service, let's just stand. We're going to sing the last part of Amazing Grace. Cheers.
so good. All right. Well, our only announcement that we have is Celebrate Recovery is Tuesday. At 7 o'clock, we have a special guest speaker um, this coming Tuesday. So please join us. Um, offering box will be in the back. And give on your way out. Uh, joyfully, of <laughs> course. Because <laughs> it is your act of worship. All right. Let's Let's uh, sing one more song, just a little bit. When you go, I'll go. When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. When you love, I'll love. When you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow. Life 